Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Charles and Marie Fish Lecture brought to you by the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. So today's lecture features journalist and author Ian Urbina, who will be discussing his best-selling book, The Outlaw Ocean, which focuses on lawlessness on the high seas. Uh, my name is Peter Hanlon. I'm the director of the Office of Marine Programs here at the Graduate School of Oceanography, which we call GSO for short. Um, so before we start, I just want to take a moment uh, and ask, please hit share on whatever platform you're watching on. On YouTube or Facebook, you can hit the share button. Or on Twitter, you can retweet so that your friends, family, and colleagues uh, can all join us for what's going to be a really fascinating lecture. Uh, and also, please be sure to let us know in the chat where are you tuning in from. We'd love to know. And of course, share any questions that you have for Ian, who will be answering those questions after his lecture today. Um, there's going to be a lot to comment on, so we'd love to hear your thoughts and your questions. OK, so before we begin, though, I do just want to give a quick bit of history about this lecture series, which goes back all the way to 1990. Um, so the Charles and Marie Fish Lecture is an annual public lecture endowed by the families of Drs. Charles and Marie Fish. Uh, the Fish has established a marine biological program at the University of Rhode Island all the way back in 1935, and eventually a graduate program in oceanography at the Narragansett uh, Marine Laboratory, which later became URI's Graduate School of Oceanography. So we're so grateful for the family support. And I'd also like to point out that Several family members and even descendants of uh, Charles and Marie Fish are here watching today. So a very special and warm welcome to them. And thank you for their support. Um, so for those of you who did register for this event on Eventbrite, you were eligible, as you know, to win uh, a special signed copy of the Outlaw Ocean signed by Ian. We had six copies. So without further ado, I do have the list of randomly select winners. Um, so their names are Gregory Bolin, Janice DiLorenzo, uh, Deirdre Lavalle, Heather McNair, Juliano Palacios and Denise Stetson. So congratulations to all of you. Uh, we'll be in touch via email to let you know the best way or find out from you the best way to get those books to you. So, so thanks again for registering. Okay, so finally, it's really my pleasure to introduce the new Dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography, Dr. Paula Bontempi, who is actually also a GSO alum. Um, so a biological oceanographer for more than 25 years, uh, Dr. Bontempi became Dean of the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography just this August. Uh, so Dr. Bontempi comes to GSO after nearly 18 years at NASA headquarters, first serving as the program manager for ocean biology and biogeochemistry research and program scientist for numerous Earth observing satellite missions. And later she was the acting, acting deputy director of the Earth Science Division and NASA's Science Mission Directorate in Washington, DC. And also, I do want to note uh, that Dr. Von Tempe is the 16 in the history of GSO's history. Um, and as fate would have it, uh, we're about to enter the sixth decade of GSO. Next year, 2021, is our 60th anniversary. So please stay in touch on our social media platforms, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, at uri.gso. Um, and we'll have lots of activities, maybe mostly virtual. Maybe things will get better <laughs> and we'll have some things in person. But we'd love to have you celebrate with us. So I will stop there. And Dean Bontempi, take it away. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, I'm, I feel really lucky to be here as Dean. And thank you for the warm welcome. I've been here two weeks. And I am absolutely honored to be able to introduce our speaker today for the FISH lecture. It's something I used to look forward to every year as a student. And I'm thrilled to be back to be here as Dean and listen in today. Um, so I would like to introduce um, Ian Urbina. He's a reporter and author who writes for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and National Geographic, as well as other um, publications. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Outlaw, o um, sorry, The Outlaw Ocean, which I'm going to hold up. I got distracted. Um, based on five years of reporting, much of it offshore, exploring lawlessness on the high seas. Urbina has since launched the Outlaw Ocean Project nonprofit, which I checked out and is an awesome website, which engages in innovative storytelling practices on ocean issues, including the Outlaw Ocean Music Project. Now, I want to tell you, I got a, an advanced copy of this book last week, um, and as soon as I picked it up, uh, you were transported into a completely different world. And what I loved about the book is that it took you from that need that we have to explore, um, the discoveries that are made in the ocean, which is absolutely boundless. I used to tell the astronauts, ocean exploration is very similar to space exploration. And then takes you into management and policy related decisions, um, science and also economics. So it was just an incredible journey that took you all around the world. So with that, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Ian Urbina. 
thank you so much um, for that overly generous introduction. Um, thank you uh, for hosting me. And um, uh, it's a real honor to be here. I have to say it was um, a little bit painful to watch that opening video because there's so much time in that video with people on the water. It kind of reminded me of what COVID existence is like and all that I'm, I'm really um, missing. So um, hopefully we will get back to um, everyone being able to do that kind of research and as a group. Um, so my plan for today's talk was that um, it would be divided essentially into three parts. Uh, the first part would be uh, 10, 15 minutes of me uh, attempting to describe the big picture of what um, uh, we do, we being me and my team at the Outlaw Ocean. Um, the second chapter, if you will, will be a look specifically at one story, uh, a most recent investigation, and how that was uh, a particularly exciting one and uh, how it brought together many of the things that we, in theory, aim to do in the journalism. And then the, the short um, third chapter would be um, a little bit of a discussion of this uh, kind of duck-billed platypus, if you will, of a creature we have created um, in this music project and just talk about what that is and what purpose it serves uh, or aspires to serve. So chapter one, um, The Outlaw Ocean. The Outlaw Ocean started um, in a conversation with an editor of mine at the New York Times where I was on staff as an investigative reporter for 17 years uh, up until about a year ago. And um, it was uh, sort of a, hey, so what's your next target, you know, topically? And I would sit down once a year with this editor and, and hash out plans. Um, and I wasn't ready for this conversation when it kind of was sprung upon me. And so prior to joining the New York Times, I had worked as a culture anthropologist in a doctoral program. And um, I had spent, I had run away from my dissertation, uh, procrastinating, and had spent some time uh, far from the University of Chicago, cold winters, uh, working on a um, ship, a research vessel um, that was anchored out of uh, Singapore. And uh, that exposure had presented me with this um, kind of bizarre, in, in my eye, um, uh, world. Um, and quite specifically, um, uh, the, the um, world of seafarers, the people more than the, the marine space. Um, and you know, interacting with those people, ranging from, you know, Geraldo Rivera's New Zealand deckhands on his super yacht that was parked there at the time, all the way over to 17-year-old migrant Indonesian tuna, uh, Taiwanese tuna longline uh, deckhands, you know, so a real gamut of different types of workers who were there at the time kind of opened my eyes very anthropologically to the, what I saw as this kind of invisible tribe, a diaspora tribe of transient workers and people who sort of had their own um, language and stories and code of ethics and hierarchies and, and um, indeed their own stories of crime, you know, um, and sort of extra legal behavior, which were far beyond anything I had ever imagined, you know, I think uh, most people, or at least I was at the time, aware of you know the BP spill kind of problems and the Somali piracy kind of problems, but not of the range of other things that happened out there. And that was um, what I carried into this conversation with my editor uh, when she said, um, what are you up to next? And I had no idea. And I said, you know, I've always fantasized about um, anthropologically taking readers out to this space that's two thirds of the planet and um, really chronicling the people and the work that occur out there in a different way, you know, um, uh, number one, with the ambition of um, broadening the taxonomy, if you will, of understanding of things, of activities and, and misbehavior often that happens out there beyond the Somali piracy and BP spill. Uh, so to include, you know, sea slavery, arms trafficking, murder of stowaways, intentional dumping of waste and oil at sea, illegal whaling, overfishing, obviously, un IUU, unregulated fishing, um, you know, whale depredation, clashes between fishermen and, and whales that had gotten smart, um, just a wide variety, repo men who are hired by New York banks to go steal ships on behalf of um, disgruntled or indebted uh, ship owners. It's just this strange, almost wild west world that existed out there. And I thought, 
wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we could take our readers out there and and I'm just the guy to do it if you let me um, give me the budget and the time um, to head out there. And luckily enough, um, uh, she uh, said, um, go for it. So that was the beginning of the series. And um, its ambition was, like I said, anthropological to chronicle the space and the concerns out there. It was also, um, it had the motivation of trying to uh, uh, recalibrate a little bit the discussion so that much of the writing, at least in my view, at the time had been, uh, that was coming out of the space, was focused on the space as an environmental story, uh, which indeed it is. And there's huge concerns and great research and, and important advocacy happening from that um, part of the playing field, if you will. But there was a lot less about um, the 56 million people that work out there, you know, and viewing it as a, uh, a frontier, a place, a, a workspace, um, uh, sort of a population, uh, and um, sort of the above the waterline concerns, if you will. And so one of the ambitions of the journalism was to um, focus on the intersection between the environmental and the human rights and the labor concerns that play out out there. Um, and also to look at the, um, uh, the, the extra legal. So not all illegal uh, and not all nefarious, though a lot of it, um, but just the things that occur outside the bounds of law. Um, some of it quite heroic, you know, um, vigilante conservationists, for example, fighting for, I think, things that many people would agree are good, you know. Um, uh, but um, so that was the second ambition. And the third ambition, methodologically and journalistically, was to really um, get out into the space and not tell these stories from land with, you know, interviews with deckhands after they got back, but rather to um, go out and spend the time in the space so you could write it in an evocative way. Um, and, you know, while you're hearing me drone on, you'll hear, you'll see some um, photos from the space and the sort of vessels that we were boarding. Um, this first picture, for example, is a picture often referred to as the Lost Boys picture. And this was in the sea slavery story, the, the, the boat, this was on the South China Sea. This was the original investigation in the paper and then subsequent two reporting trips that occurred after I left the paper for a two year book leave to go back at the topic. Um, this was uh, the boat we spent the most time on in the South China Sea as a Thai uh, purse signer. Um, and it was um, 40 Cambodian crew. These are the crew, uh, some of them as young as we speculate 16, 15 years old, and some, you know, all the way up to about 40 years old, um, Thai officers, and sort of an opportunity to look at, you know, why um, human trafficking and forced labor occurs in this uh, fleet and in many places in the world, what are the, mecha the push mechanisms that end up there, and to what degree uh, is there um, a connection with illegal fishing and, and subsidies and all sorts of other issues um, that come to, to play there. Um, but in general, so the, 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 the book ultimately and the original core reporting in the Times and now the ongoing reporting uh, that are coming out of the nonprofit all have still those ambitions, an exploration of this place, a, a look at both environmental and human stories and the intersectionality of them, an emphasis on things that are broken, sort of the in investigative reporter's ethic of trying to look at um, uh, not beat reporting and updating on what happened there, but rather looking for things that are of concern and highlighting them in a rigorous and fair and nuanced way, hopefully, that helps explain solutions uh, without stepping into advocacy. Um, uh, and then also really reported on site. Uh, and um, so that's sort of the ambition of the journalism itself. I'll just segue now to the, the most recent uh, large investigation that was published about a month ago uh, in NBC News. Um, and um, uh, before I do that, I'll just say sort of uh, in my trajectory, um, it went as follows. The initial series ran in the New York Times, um, eight stories on the front page and one story in the magazine. At that point, um, Netflix and Leo DiCaprio and his company approached and said, would you consider going back out, producing kind of the definitive book on this if you can? Um, and then we would like to option the book. And optioning it means we'd like to make content um, uh, doc, uh, documentary series um, about um, the reporting and its findings. 
Uh, I asked permission from the New York Times to have a leave for two years. They granted it. I went back out to sea with a Brazilian photographer named Fabio Nascimento, and we built the book. And the book came out roughly a year ago um, and is, you know, 15 chapters, five of it, the original stories in the paper, and then the other 10s, all new reporting. Um, and then after the book came out, I was supposed to go back to the Times. I did for a while. And I found myself um, struggling to put it down. You know, the stories were so urgent and so dramatic on the one hand that I had touched on and also hadn't gotten a chance to touch on um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the the journalism of the sort I'm describing, so not beat reporting, not short, kind of just the facts, man type journalism, but rather narrative, high gloss, big impact stories was, was so limited coming out of this space that those two factors haunted me and made me want to go back at it. Um, and so I stepped away from the Times, created a nonprofit to produce these stories and to produce them for the Times, New York Times, and other venues in the world, and uh, just to continue with this line of reporting. And um, we're a year in uh, at the Outlaw Ocean Project and um, have produced three big investigations and about 15 other stories. Um, so it's all going well. And one of those stories is this story about that ran on NBC and about, you know, now 40 other newspapers around the world have also run it in multiple languages. The story, um, I love the story for a couple of reasons. One, it is truly at the intersection of the environmental and the human rights and labor concerns in the sense that this was a story at its root that revealed what is said to be the largest um, uh, ever documented illegal fishing fleet um, to the tune of about 900 Chinese squid vessels that for um, the last several years at least uh, have been routinely fishing within North Korean waters. Now, um, after 2017, the, um, the Ch China and North Korea have, have long had a legal relationship in which licenses were granted um, for the, the fleet to be in those waters. But after the nuclear tests that led to UN sanctions in 2017, which were unanimously signed by the Security Council members of which China is one, um, it became very explicitly and clearly illegal for any foreign vessels to be in any capacity in North Korean fishing in North Korean waters. Um, so what we and we as a team of academics from Japan, South Korea, uh, Russia, and the U.S. and um, spearheaded by a, a really amazing organization called Global Fishing Watch um, and the, the Outlaw Ocean Project set out to do was number one um, corroborate and document in a rigorous way what had been anecdotal, anecdotally known for a while, which is that Chinese vessels were still in North Korean waters in significant numbers. Um, South Koreans and Japanese fishermen had been reporting this often anonymously to, U, to the UN for a while, but um, no one had ever put a number and put concrete evidence on it. Um, Global Fishing Watch um, is an organization that specializes in maritime analysis uh, with the benefit of um, uh, satellite um, technology of various sorts. And let me make sure my computer doesn't shut off because it's trying to do an update. Um, uh, and so Global Fishing Watch thought um, we uh, probably can lay eyes on the fleet that's in North Korean waters, um, even though this fleet has turned off their locational transponders, their AIS equipment, so they are a dark fleet, we still can see them uh, by using different types of technology, one of which is distinctly equipped to spotting these vessels because many of these vessels, these squid vessels, use bright lights at night. And one type of satellites are especially good at seeing bright lights at night. So though that technology coupled with various others allowed these researchers from Global Fishing Watch to lay eyes on these this huge fleet. And it was way bigger than initially expected. So breakthrough number one was getting the data that corroborated that. Then my role was um, to figure out how to make this more or different than merely an academic, and merely as a disrespectful term, um, strictly an academic um, revelation. And rather to try to um, take this and make it consumable 
um, to the public at large. And so that meant narrative, you know, journalism. And that meant in my model, we need to get out there and actually lay eyes on it and film it and, you know, firsthand corroborate what the data seems to indicate. So um, I assembled a team and we went to South Korea. We bought our way, and here we are boarding it uh, onto a South Korean squid vessel and coupled with um, this gentleman you see in the picture, uh, which is uh, Jae Yoon Park, uh, someone who works for Global Fishing Watch. We then went to the area where we thought we would likely spot the Chinese as they traveled through South Korean waters and headed into North Korean waters. Let me make sure I'm doing okay on time. Um, there were two core mysteries now to go to the, the point that um, really attracted me to this story. Obviously, a journalist likes superlative categories. So the, the possibility of talking about the biggest ever fishing fleet discovered is, is super attractive. But what really interested me was, number one, these there was an environmental mystery and a human rights mystery that we had the chance to help solve. One was, why in the past decade has the squid um, stock in these waters plummeted you know, by roughly 80%? That's a huge drop off. What's contributing to that? Clearly, the speculation was, climate change, but what else? And the theory was this industrial fleet, right, uh, of squitters. The second mystery was why are um, North Korean fishermen um, uh, washing up um, on old rickety wooden boats uh, dead, you know, um, every year in Japan? W why are so many of them dying at sea and washing up? Um, and this is an example of that, uh, of one such boat. Um, the theory there, the going theory, not incorrect, was that a lot of pressure from the North Korean government was forcing North Korean fishermen to go further out at sea, further than they were really equipped to. They got stuck out there, hit by a storm, capsized, engine died, whatever, and they starved and were then washing up on Japanese shores. But our theory was that there were other variables at play, quite probably the presence of this massive industrial fleet that was also trapping um, these fishermen out too far or forcing them to go even further than they previously were. Uh, and this was a factor. So we went to South Korea um, uh, and boarded a South Korean uh, squid vessel, went out to sea looking for uh, corroboration of the presence of these ships. and. We saw a blip on radar uh, that indicated there was one suspect ship headed through a, um, a, down the avenue, if you will. We went to those coordinates and lo and behold, that was not one ship, it was an entire fleet, a row of 10 of them that we subsequently saw several more rows after that. Um, and these ships were uh, dark, meaning they were sort of hiding out with their transponders turned off, except for the lead vessel, so it didn't crash into anything. And they were on their way to North Korea. And we attempted to follow this vessel. Um, we put a drone up and we um, um, videoed them and tried to make um, uh, radio contact with them to no avail. Ultimately, this the lead vessel of this convoy turned off, made aggressive motions, blew the horn, and then came directly at us to ram. And our hired um, uh, boat captain said, that's enough. You know, like he's not looking to die and um, decided that uh, that was as far as as dangerous as he wanted to get. And so we turned back and headed to port, but we had gotten what we had wanted. We then put the story out with NBC News. We'd been working with them for almost a year on the story um, and we published it with NBC News, but we then um, also set up a relationship with partners in 40 other countries and 20 other languages in which we had the story translated and co-published throughout the world. Um, and so this was like the perfect, um, this is what I left the Times to hopefully do, and here we were doing it. You know, a tier one venue with a big audience, but also not exclusivity in the form that I had to remain at the New York Times, where a story just goes to one publication, but rather um, setting it up so that it can be seen by a much broader audience and therefore have much greater impact. Um, uh, so this was a great success story. Um, the the story then uh, with interviews with. Um, uh, North Korean defectors and and others um, uh, then shed new light on indeed the presence of these typically very aggressive uh, and quite large and numerous Chinese squid vessels in these waters was indeed pushing the North Korean uh, artisanal fishermen much further out to sea. And that's why we had seen in these years a drastic uptick in the number of these um, ghost boats that were washing up on shore. Um, uh, so um, 
this was the ambition and this is what the findings um, revealed. Um, now just to sort of transition, trying to watch my clock here, to the, the final note, which was one of the reasons, one of the aspirations I had when I left the Times was, I, I loved the New York Times and still do, and thought um, it um, we did um, really great journalism. Um, the rigor, the polish, um, uh, the daring um, to go after stories that others wouldn't, uh, quite especially investigative international. Um, there were luxuries there because of the size of the budget and the staff um, to tackle stories, even like the outlaw ocean that most institutions wouldn't be able to afford. Um, and so I was quite lucky to be there, but um, the gray lady, the nickname for the New York times um, is a very um, cautious and um, careful moving creature. And um, I wanted to try um, some new things when it came to tactics of distribution and daring experiments, creative experiments, including taking this journalism and converting, you know, abiding by the core um, reporting rigor that really is the, um, the base of it all. Um, and, but then taking a story like this and um, figuring out how to translate it into other mediums so as to get it seen by more people and different people. So for example, I have a 16 year old son. He is very smart and consumes a lot of news, but doesn't read the New York Times. And, and, and um, a lot of his news comes from comedy, um, music, YouTube. Um, so sort of these alternate sources of information uh, for better or for worse. And I think he's fairly typical in that regard. And I thought, you know, I really would like that age demographic globally to be in some way more informed by the kind of reporting we're doing. So they know about sea slavery or um, overfishing. Um, and so I thought, what if we teamed up with um, musicians and we found some clever way to essentially convert Spotify into a journalistic platform and we could get at those consumers where they are rather than try to bring them to us. And what would it look like if we um, did a bit like what um, Lin-Manuel Miranda did with Hamilton um, in the form of taking a body of work, um, namely in this case, the Outlaw Ocean, and um, approach musicians of varying sorts, hip hop, classical, electronic, what have you, respectfully say, would you consider consuming this reporting, some or all of it, see what speaks to you, um, we will then make accessible to you a body of sounds which are stripped from the reporting. So rich textured sounds, uh, machine gun fire in Somalia, chanting deckhands on the South China Sea, what have you, things that are really interesting and textured, a sample file and interviews with Secretary of State John Kerry and the stowaway who almost died at sea and all these different materials. And would you then do what you do well, which is make music, but that's based on this reporting. And then we will take your album and we will pair it with the imagery in a respectful way that doesn't commercialize violence and that sort of thing. And then we will funnel it through channels, your channels to your audience, but use this as almost like a gateway drug, if you will, to the audience so that they can begin learning or being intrigued by these issues. And maybe if the experiment goes well, they click from the music to the website, from the website to the article and off we go, right? Now they're consuming it. Um, this was the experiment, and it's so far worked amazingly well. Um, we've been running the music project for almost a year now. We have 430 musicians of all sorts, classical, hip hop, everywhere, from 80 different countries, a collective listenership of 90 million. Um, some of the streaming revenue that's made from the music, it's not huge money, but that um, goes, 50% of any money made on the music goes directly to the nonprofit to produce more stories. So you have almost a financial model that allows for further journalism to occur. Um, this journalism is insanely and impossibly expensive. I'll give you sort of a look under the hood. A typical story, um, like a piece that's coming out in a couple months in The New Yorker that we produced, um, will take maybe nine to 12 months to produce, probably going to three different countries offshore to the tune of $90,000, $100,000. Um, for everything involved, for Fabio, flights, etc. cetera. Um, a tier one well-paying venue like the New Yorker may pay maximum eight, ten, eight to $10,000 for the piece, right? So 
you do the math. Um, there's a huge financial gap, and that's why you see very little of this. Um, so these alternate models, like the music project, are meant to try to help begin closing that gap. Um, but it's also really a way to get at my son, you know, and to get at these other demographics with the footage. And once we got large enough, we couldn't get Spotify or Pandora or any of these places to engage with us until we actually started releasing 50 albums every two months, which is what we're doing now. And suddenly like they, they paid attention and they got in touch and they said, this is amazing. We want to get involved. How can we help? And I said, open up your platform and let me start running video on your platform so that I can get people listening to the music to see the footage um, more effectively. And they said, great, we'll do it. You know, we, we really like what you're doing. And this is the beginning of um, what it set out to do was sort of bring journalism. And that was just one example of the kind of things, the kind of creative um, um, disruption that we hoped to accomplish. Uh, we also, and I'll, I'll stop very soon. Let me see what time I'm at, 25. Um, similarly, other um, trans, translation plays, right? So again, always starting with a core journalism, written text, narrative, research in this way, ideally published in a print venue. But then what are we gonna do with that content additionally? And so podcasts, animation, music, video game, these are all the places we intend to go. And so we have a Nat Geo deal just signed a couple months ago where we're making a podcast about on the reporting and based on the sounds and based on new and old stories, et cetera. Um, we're talking with video game designers about, is there a way to do this without uh, turning it into Grand Theft Audio, which is not my goal, but nonetheless um, making it educational and yet still fun, you know, and, 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 um, and, and, and then at the end of this, um, after, after we do Q and A, um, you'll see an example of an initial experiment with animation um, in which, on this very story I just discussed, the North Korean fishing story, um, we approached a South Korean animator, a young woman just out of animation school, um, and said, we've got two months before this story is going to run. Would you read it, take a look at our huge archive of footage, and would you craft a, a artistic rendering of the story or the points that speak to you? You have creative freedom. Um, we then will want to facilitate the music behind it by using one of our classical composers um, to put the music with the animation. And then we're going to put it out and see how it goes and see what, you know, what it looks like. And we did just that. And at the end of our session here, we'll play, it's, I think it's two, two minutes and 50 seconds long um, uh, animation video that we'll play and people can watch those um, if, they, if they want. One thing I'll say, and I, I was supposed to do this at the beginning, but I just remember now, um, is that um, I want to play an example of one song that was uh, that was part of the first wave of albums we put out. It's by a musician from Mexico, very small musician, a guy named De Osos, which means of bears, also in Spanish is bears. And um, he has kind of a Radiohead type of vibe to him, and he... Um, he took from within the archive of the sound sample archive, he took a speech that then Secretary of State uh, John Kerry gave at the UN in which Kerry recounted the story of Lang Long, who is a Cambodian man who we featured in the original sea slavery story, who was shackled by the neck while um, uh, uh, on a fishing vessel, and this is a picture of Lang Long. Um, and we, I interviewed him in Thailand and Songkla um, a month after he had returned to shore, a very broken individual who'd been captive for two years and sold boat to boat. Secretary of State John Kerry was moved by the story, gave a speech all about it and recounted the story. Deosos, the Mexican artist, um, was moved by Kerry's speech, which was in the archive, and made a song in which in this, in my view, beautiful fashion is a gentle on-ramp and then you hear Carrie give the speech and tell in this haunting voice what happened to Lang Long. We'll just listen to 30 seconds of it and see a video that we paired with it just to give a feel for one version of a song of many thousands. Um, and then I'll probably stop there and open it up for questions. So if you could play that bit, it'd be great. If you get a 
chance, go Google this New York Times article a couple of weeks ago um, about illegal fishing. It was a front page story, a very dramatic story. It told the story of a young Cambodian boy, a young Cambodian boy, who was lured as a, as a refugee, essentially. He was looking for construction work. Yeah, and I don't know why I fell in love so much with that song, but we've now released over a thousand songs and that one really lives with me. I think it's just Carrie's rendering of the story is really genuine and passionate and it's paced just so. And um, uh, it's just, I just think it's it's the perfect matching of haunting music with um, with sound samples. So, um, so this is what, I do, we do, um, and um, uh, I, I welcome questions. All right, Ian, thank you so much. Um, I think for anyone who hasn't read your stories in the New York Times or various other articles or your book, these are pretty eye-opening uh, stories um, of things that are going on out of sight, out of mind on the high seas. So I really appreciated this last part of you talking about um, you know, getting beyond some of these traditional journalism boundaries um, and reaching wider audiences. So thank you for that. Um, so yeah, so we're ready for some Q&A and we have some great questions lined up already from our viewers. So thank you for those. And I would say, uh, prompt you, please um, send more. We do have some time for Q&A. And uh, really to start us off, I think we'll go with um, Dean Bontempi who would, uh, has a question for you, Ian. Yeah, no, um, thank you so much for that. I mean, I love how you've tied together science um, policy and then tried to find a way to translate that and make it relevant for so many demographics. It's such a hard thing to do, which is to explain to the public why they should care, right? Mm. Um, and you've done that in a really moving way. And I think that illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing and human rights violations really thrive on an opaque ocean. Um, I wonder if there's something that institutions like GSO could do to make these issues uh, more transparent. Mm. Yeah, well, first of all, I do want to take a moment and say, I think um, academics in general and um, ocean and marine science academics in specific have an especially tough job in figuring out how to do this translation. Um, and getting people to care about fish is tougher than other types of creatures and getting people to care about creatures in general is really tough. Um, so um, uh, I really appreciate also that th that academics give me such sustained access and trust me to not bastardize their work, um, but to um, try to find ways to explain it in narrative form. Um, in terms of um, meta solutions that kind of emerged after five years of reporting, I do think, um, your opaque word choice is is apt, right? Um, one of the core problems is you can't counter what you don't count. And if you're not able to even see what's happening out there, journalistically um, or uh, via, um, and again, uh, above or below the waterline, um, uh, then there's no hope of policing or studying or finding causes for, right? And so I personally think um, whether it's sea slavery or arms trafficking or dumping oil at sea or IUU, all of these things would be massively benefited by a huge uh, improvement in funding for satellite technology and the uh, affordability and accessibility by academics like yourselves um, to that data um, and the public in general, journalists included. Um, uh, I think also from a policy standpoint, harder to achieve, but um, requiring sh stricter rules on, for example, um, unique vessel identifiers. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the way that in my humble vision, humble opinion, um, these things likely will happen is either via the marketplace or via governments. I have more faith in the marketplace, not because I'm some Smithian, but because I think it tends to be faster acting than mm -hmm. governments and it's less politically, um, it's not country by country, the market is international, et cetera. And so you could pass a law that says, look, you're not going to uh, bring tuna or you know cuttlefish or whatever into our port and access our market unless you comply with these basic requirements. 
And that's great, but it's only one port in one country. Whereas if a big buyer, a Walmart or what have you, or the EU says you can't access our market writ large unless you, that's probably going to happen faster and um, have more impact in my view. Um, so those sorts of supply chain pressures and also funding for technology and um, w w are two big steps I think um, that could help. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think we can jump into some of our viewer questions. It'd be great. Um, okay, great. So we have a question first from Brendan. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, really fantastic. Thank you for your work. How do you find your stories, Ian? What leads you to an interesting story? Well, um, I in the outlaw ocean space, my whole career, I've switched topics every two, three years. And that's wonderful and terrible. The Owl Ocean is the first time in my career that I've stayed with one thing for almost a decade now. Um, and it's a, such a delight because you actually can um, develop long-term relationships, figure out all the sources, really become versed in it, and know where to be reading all the time and have systems for capture of, wait, that's a really interesting story. When I have time, I want to loop back to that. So you put it in a certain folder. and and so. Now I'm in my dream scenario where I have, you know, four or five young women, they're all female um, uh, staff that are located all over the place. None of them uh, um, in Washington, D.C., where I'm based. And they all um, are constantly reading for interesting stories that are relevant to things that we're already doing or um, are just interesting. You know, and we, we have meetings often twice a day um, where people float things that they've seen and want to make sure that. I was aware of and where should we put that? So we have a, a very sophisticated filing system for like leads, right? Um, in the case of the Outlaw Ocean in its original manifestation, um, those initial stories uh, I knew vaguely of and then researched into. Um, and then I also had sources I put the word out to. So for example, the very first story in the book, I can't remember where it ran in the series in the paper, was about the, the longest chase in nautical history and this, this um, law enforcement chase of the world's most wanted scofflaw vessel called the Thunder. And it's this really epic story that walked to me via a source. Um, I got a call from a guy at Interpol who I knew and he trusted me and I him. And I said, hey, I'm really on the market for maritime crime stories. And a couple months later, he said, hey, have you heard about this whole thing going on down in the Southern Ocean? Uh, it's pretty epic and you should you should be aware of it. So sometimes you get tips like that, but most often you're just reading broadly. And, and the key thing as a journalist is to have a really good system for capturing things because sometimes you don't have time then, but six months later you do to loop back to them. Thank you so much. Um, so we have another question from Ms. Gio Bean. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have any insights as to why Vietnamese offshore fishing has been much less examined than elsewhere, despite European Union yellow card and illegal fishing. No, it's like a it's a question close to my heart, you know, I um, and one that I wondered only in route to reporting the book. And I'll tell you a quick story. So I went to Indonesia to take a look at what was sort of an understory relating to then fisheries minister Susi S U S I, who is this famous, really impressive woman who was doing very aggressive things in. Um, uh, to some degree, for the first time in Indonesian history, in really policing Indonesian waters, and um, was teamed up with Pew and some other key players, the Australian Navy, and had, you know, and so there was a lot of attention, and she was the darling of the ocean advocacy community because she was taking such a strong stand on IUU and burning foreign boats when they would come in, taking the crew off, obviously. But um, so I want to go because I had heard there's this other story, which is when those ships get stopped, which uh, of which there were many of them the crew who the deckhands have no say in where they're going off and they don't even know where they are. And really are, they are not, shouldn't be charged, right? They, 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 it's the officers who make the decisions and, and the owners who really should be charged. But there are large numbers of deckhands who are being taken off these ships and being warehoused essentially in immigration facilities, sometimes for years, um, and kind of lost to the system. And they were not trafficking victims, but also not convicted illegal fishers, they were kind of in the middle. And I kind of wanted to go look into that story because it concerned me. And it, um, I expected to find that those facilities were full of Thai 
fishers and they were full of Vietnamese fishers. And the boats, at the, I mean, these are in obscure islands around Indonesia where we went to check them out and to visit the facilities. They were all Vietnamese, all Vietnamese blue boats. And that was my first realization. Wow, you know, the Vietnamese are real, and there's a Vietnamese blue boat, um, are really a huge presence and none of us are talking about it. So that doesn't answer your question. Um, I completely agree with the spirit in which it's asked. Um, it's a huge fleet. It's a subsidized fleet. It's a bloated fleet that should be probably half its size. And it's a largely overlooked fleet, except for the EU yellow card. But by Western journalism, it hasn't been thoroughly investigated. I suspect that there are probably serious trafficking concerns on them, but I can't say that with basis. Uh, so I share the concern. Cambodia is also the other place that very much merits um, Bur um, Rohingya and, and Burmese workers and trafficked individuals on Cambodian boats. Those two fleets in the South China Sea are the ones that have gotten very little attention. Uh, and I, um, at hopefully in the next five years, we'll um, I do something about that. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so from Kathleen, who's asking, what has been the response to your reporting internationally? It's a really broad question, so tough to answer. I mean, um, there are outcomes that are meta and micro, right? So um, from on the, on the high altitude level, the macro level, you have, um, especially under the Obama administration, less so, but to some degree now, but especially under the Obama administration, and especially under Secretary of State John Kerry, and I have no particular, I know him now well, and he's actually become a part of the film project. Um, but at that time, he was just a source, right? And But he, because of his Navy background and Boston origins, on the one hand, and because of his own interests, um, he, he had long history in the ocean space and the anti-trafficking space. So this series, to some degree, registered with him, and he understood it and, was, and cared about it to a degree that... Um, was unusual. And so his State Department, especially its Trafficking in Persons office, um, were very, very much involved uh, on the level of policy and rewriting rules, all the way to the level of criminal investigations and cooperating with the Thai government as they went after the guys that enslaved Lang Long, who ultimately were captured, convicted, and are now in jail. Um, uh, so on a big picture level, you have policy changes, rules rewritten, um, uh, you know, sort of. Um, on the boring bureaucratic level, you know, NOAA, fish guys, um, and uh, State Department, trafficking in persons office, TIP office, um, human folk, right, um, often didn't play nice together. In the very siloed way that bureaucracies often emerge, these two agencies um, didn't get invited to each other's meetings, and, stuff like, and there was something called the Our Ocean Conference. And the state folks, who were very much working on sea slavery issues were not being invited to attend the Our Ocean Conference. So again, perfect example, I called and said, hey, I'm going to write a story about this. Um, this is a huge problem. You guys, once again, are focusing on marine issues at the exclusion of human issues. And that's uh, something that I care a lot about and, and feel like merits the story. And so you had a constant conversation going on with the government, the Thai embassy, et cetera. So you have lots of policy changes, and then you have lots of individual outcomes of the reporting, like Lang Long's story was radically altered um, uh, after the piece ran. Um, so, uh, and everything in between, you know, um, and not just government players, companies and class action lawyers who work on these sorts of things have picked up um, research we've been doing and built cases around them. Um, so it varies. That's great. Um, I think our next question comes from NB. So this is regards to the music project. Are there any plans to make some of the art examples publicly available so that independent creators could utilize them in order to further increase outreach? This is a good question. Um, and I haven't thought of it before, so I'm going to wing it. Um, no is the first answer, if only because um, that 10K versus 100K gap that I'm trying to figure out how to bridge, like the $90,000 we need to to um, do the next story, to go to North Korea and waters, et cetera. Like we have to, no venue is going to cover that. So we rely on individual donors. People are like, hey, I like what you're doing. Here's 20 bucks. And big philanthropies, hey, here's more. 
And then these creative entrepreneurial endeavors that um, help subsidize. And those three methods are what will keep the journalism afloat. So the it took six months to build the archive. We had to go through five years of footage. That was all man hours that I paid out of a book advance. <laughs> the Times doesn't pay for it. So it's like, um, for lots of reasons, there's there's a proprietary element to the music um, that isn't just to enrich me, which I don't think I'll ever do, but but to, to keep the journalism going. And if I make the sound, the archive um, open, um, it kind of writes me out of the equation. <laughs> um, so not for the time being. We do, you know, are, are, we are signing two to three new artists a week. Um, so we're, co we're constantly trying to grow um, and add new artists who are um, willing to participate, but within that structure. Got it. All right. Thanks for that. Um, so from Andrea, how does an artist get involved in the Outlaw Ocean Music Project? Um, I didn't plant this question, I swear. Um, uh, <laughs> The, so the, the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, uh, you can always start with theoutlawocean.com and on there, it's all the journalism, but there's a learn about the music project and you can go over the Outlaw Ocean Music Project is theoutlawoceanmusic.com. And, um, you know, my email and the company that runs it is called Synesthesia Media, which I created as a company just to run this project, but it's its own company and they run it now. And, um, you know, uh, you just shoot an email to them and they sort of then figure out um, uh, whether and how to on-ramp um, artists. There are some parameters on um, which artists can be signed, but they sort of handle all that. But you just shoot, shoot me an email or them an email and off you go. But you, you can read about it. If you want to get acclimated more to it, the, the website has an about page and you can learn more there. All right, so creatives should reach out to you. That's great. That's okay. the problem. Uh, do you fit the music to the story or does the story inspire the music? Yeah, so um, I ask, so uh, the story in, is, well, in theory, what's supposed to happen is the story is supposed to sort of, um, inform the music. And so what that means is we have a classical composer from Taiwan and we say, we'd like you to read the book or at least parts of the book um, and figure out what speaks to you. There's this game I played when I, when my son was 10 and I'd be driving around and I'd have him and two of his friends in the backseat. And I would, it was called the imagination game. And I would play usually Hans Zimmer or Max Richter, one of these like composers that ma makes music for movies, soundtrack and, and very dramatic music without words. And I'd play 15 seconds of it up to the break. And then I'd turn it off and I'd say, okay, each of you tell me, What's the scene in your head that you see that goes with that? So it's almost a reverse, it's a writing exercise without words, right? It's a creativity exercise where you're reverse engineering from music into story or narrative or imagery or whatever. And it was really fun and really cool and they loved it and I loved it. And that was one of the things that made me think, this is what I should do with adults, you know, where I, but in the other direction where I say, here's the story, you find what emotionally speaks to you, issues, characters, exchanges, dialogue, scene setting, and then make music from it. If possible, use stuff from the sound samples, but you don't have to. I'm not gonna dictate how much or where or how, or even that, it can be completely interpretive. And then you title it as such, you bring it back to synesthesia. Then synesthesia takes it, we handle the making, we don't give the, the videos to anyone because copyright and tone and proprietary issues of wanting to make sure we don't trivialize the footage. Um, so then synesthesia takes the music, with what the artist has said it's about. Usually they provide a written description of, I wrote this song based on this scene and what it made me feel, whatever. And then we make a video, or Synesthesia makes a video, shows it back to the artist, says, are you okay with this? Um, then they make the album art, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a release date and it all comes out. The music goes on Spotify and 200 other platforms. And then also the video comes out and et cetera. And that's, so there is some back and forth, but it largely starts with the artist interpreting the story, the musician. All right, thanks, Ian. We have time for probably two more questions. So let's see what we have here. So we have one from John. Um, after John Kerry's discussion, did the area governments get involved in the situation? Yeah, I mean, area governments actually got involved before the US government, you know, Kerry and such. Um, so area varies, right, for these stories. So there were, uh, each story is located usually on a different issue. Sea slavery was largely based on the South China Sea and involved 
you know, Thailand and Myanmar and Laos and Indonesia and a bunch of, um, and all those governments eventually sometimes kicking and screaming um, uh, after the story ran and they were bludgeoned into it. Uh, others preemptively um, got involved, um, but the, you know, murder of stowaways, we have a piece, this isn't public, but a, a piece about a murder that was caught on camera that originally was reported in 2015, we broke that story. There's been a huge break in the case, namely they arrested the captain that we identified last month, two weeks ago in uh, Taiwan. And now that I'm free to do this, I've written a story for the Washington Post and that piece is due to come out next week um, about uh, the arrest of that captain and what we now know new. And that's in the book as well. So um, yeah, governments have been um, involved in different ways. Taiwan was super involved in that, obviously. So it depends on the story, but yeah, all the governments, not all, but many of the governments uh, have have been engaged um, sometimes against their will. All right, so I think we have time for one more um, that will pop up. Oh yeah, so I guess Ian, beyond your travels around the world, what are your hobbies and favorite book? Um, so I am a runner, um, very slow and um, uh, short distances now, but have run all my life. So um, uh, that's one hobby um, that sort of is an anchor of every day. Um, uh, I, li I love music and, and listen to music and probably sooner listen to music than watch TV, but I also like movies um, and books. Uh, hmm. Um, you know, they're sort of, Clifford Gertz is an American anthropologist um, uh, and um, happens to be a beautiful, amazing writer. And um, I often, um, uh, read him, um, uh, Michael Andachi, um, another favorite of mine, um, Eric Hobsbawm, a Marxist historian, read a lot of him. Um, so to the, I, I read mostly, um, nonfiction. Um, normally these days I don't have much time for a full book. So I read the New Yorker, um, largely because I want a steady diet of really good writing. Um, and just to sort of grow in that field. And that's usually how I do it, is try to read much yeah. better others than me. That's great. And Ian, I don't want to let go. We had a few people ask, um, you talked about your option with um, Leonardo DiCaprio and his production team, but asking if there will be a documentary made from the book. So any more details about that? Yeah, in theory, that's what they optioned, right? They optioned um, with a plan of doing a scripted series. That means nonfiction, sort of, and that project is inching forward. And then the doc series, nonfiction, which would have a crew follow Fabio and I, use archival footage of the last six years, and then also these ongoing reports. We had someone with us on the Korean, the New Yorker thing in off the coast of Gambia and, and heading to Libya next. Um, and that doc series um, uh, would be the other front. And the one that I frankly care about and have more control of because it's nonfiction. Um, uh, things are moving very slow because we have a lot of big players involved. Um, John Kerry's involved now as a producer and Netflix and Leo DiCaprio. Um, uh, but as I, I don't engage a whole lot, except for when they're like, hey, the crew's coming with you. That's when I pay attention. But all the plans on stuff is handled by my agent and um, I just show up to phone calls when I'm told to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Ian, thank you so much for your time. I want to give you a chance. Any kind of final things you'd like to leave us with? No, I mean, it's just a real honor um, to be here. And I, I would, I, I do really um, li like to hear from folks and kind of have ongoing conversations with academics or advocates or just consumers of the stuff. And um, so please don't hesitate to send me an email at ian at theoutlawocean.com. And, um, uh, you know, I think, like I said initially, that we would uh, maybe play this animation video, which has this beautiful music that was written by a composer um, for it, and then the drawing, and it's a rendering of the Korea story. Um, but thank you for the time. Yeah, thank you. And I would encourage everyone to visit the website. Definitely, we can put it on the ticker again um, and visit to learn more about the music, the stories. The donation page, which as was discussed, it's definitely not inexpensive to do this kind of work. So um, I think what we'll do, we'll leave it if we go to uh, Dean Bontempi, she has kind of a final thought to wrap it up. And thank you so much everyone for being here. And thank you, Ian.
Yeah, no, thank you very much, Ian and Peter. Um, I mean, it's just been such a moving hour for me. You've made me think about what I think is an incredibly um, important scientific and policy related issue that touches all of our lives in a, in a very different light. And so I have a lot to think about for the institution moving forward. And I really appreciate the thorough writing and reporting. And I look forward to the article in the post next week. Congratulations on that. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much, everyone. And like I said, be in touch on our social media channels. We'll have more events uh, over the coming year. We have lots of live events every week. So take care and we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you.